Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Samantha van der Slot. I'm leading the Vaccines and Society Unit uh, here in Oxford, hosted at the Oxford Vaccine Group. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome Associate Professor Katie Atwell, um, who's come from the University of Western Australia. Uh, she's been working on the area of vaccine uptake for nearly 10 years. Uh, she's a leading expert on mandatory vaccination. Uh, her work has included research about communities and healthcare systems, and she draws on insights from behavioural science, politics, law and policy. Um, we've been really lucky to host uh, Katie at the Vaccines and Society Unit. She kicked off our launch event uh, on Friday, so you, uh, a couple of you might have seen her shorter presentation then. Um, she was comparing national vaccine mandates. Today she's going to be talking about a related topic, um, but we have a bit more time to deep dive. Um, she's going to be exploring the question of whether childhood vaccine mandates are tackling the right problem. And just before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this talk will be live streamed, so we've got quite a number of people who've signed up to watch online, and it's also being recorded. Uh, if you're watching online on Crowdcast um, and you'd like to ask a question, we've got about 15 minutes at the end to ask questions, um, please press the ask question button and, and Clara's going to be helping us with um, fielding those questions. Uh, so Katie's going to present uh, for the next 40 minutes or so and then we've got yeah, quite a good amount of time at the end for questions. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Katie Atwell. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here at the Oxford Martin School. Sam, thank you so much for being a wonderful host to me here at Oxford. I'm having a wonderful time. And thanks to those who saw my presentation on Friday and have, have come back for more. I did promise it would be different content, and it is. You may find some familiar topics that I mentioned, but we're going to dive quite deep into them today. And to those who haven't seen me present yet, hello and welcome, and thank you for coming to watch, and thank you for watching online as well. So, before COVID-19 hit and uh, vaccine policy and vaccine mandates became a, an issue of absolute global preoccupation, there was another significant policy development. And it may have passed you by here in the UK because it didn't happen here. But that was several high-income jurisdictions across the globe making childhood vaccination mandatory in ways they had not done before, seeking to impose consequences for vaccine refusal. Um, and I was sitting in one of those places, Australia, and our states were doing it, our federal government was doing it, and I was really eager to understand what, why, why now, why all of this? So I uh, convinced our um, funding uh, agency in Australia to fund a big three-year fellowship for me to go off and explore that very question. So I, I've had a great time. I've been to um, all of these places. <laughs> I've been to... Um, California, to Italy, to France, and that's my home city of Perth. Um, so I've been travelling around, speaking to people, trying to understand this phenomenon. Um, and it was all about looking at these four, which were the first four to adopt these policies. Others have since followed in their footsteps, um, but I wanted to understand these first four in the first instance. So when I say mandatory vaccination, what do I mean? Well, I'm talking about imposing meaningful consequences for non-vaccination, and in particular for vaccine refusal. So the idea of a mandate that you can't easily get out of just because you don't want to vaccinate. But of course, these policies do operate differently in the different jurisdictions, and I talked about this on Friday. So they might operate through not letting you into early education and childcare, or into school. They might operate through the welfare system and withdraw some money from you you might even get fined. So all of these are different kinds of consequences. I'm not drilling into those today, but just to say that these policies are not always the same, but they're seeking to do the same thing, which is make vaccine refusal have a consequence. I should also just um, give you a heads up that I'm currently writing a book um, about my wonderful four case study. And what I'm presenting today is really sort of one chapter of that book, but it will pull in a few different bits. I also have a book coming out just on the California case with Professor Mark Navin, who's an um, American philosopher. So we've just dived into the California case and told that story. It is quite a story. Book coming out with Oxford University Press later this year. This book you're hearing about 
probably be more like next year. So, um, the book will explore lots more than I'm talking about today. Agenda setting in particular, we're sort of, we are talking about that today, but that, you know, how did these policies get on the agenda and why? Um, design, you know, the different types I talked about, why each one in a different place? Implementation is a huge part of vaccine mandates um, and something that I've dived pretty deep into as well. And lastly, impact. I am very clear in all of my work. I don't study the way that vaccine mandates influence disease in a community. That's a bridge too far for my skill set. What I'm interested in is I, I finish with uptake figures and other kind of unintended um, consequences on society and people. But I'm not interested in sort of, well, I'm interested, but I don't study how we get from a vaccine mandate to do we then have disease outbreaks or not? That's, that's for the epidemiologists and others to determine. So today, we're actually looking at this question of how public, expert and government perceptions of a particular kind of problem, i.e. non-vaccination or perhaps more specifically vaccine refusal, um, how does the way people sort of think about that and what they're saying about it inform how they identify the problem and who is the policy target? Who are they actually trying to reach when they bring in these policies? Um, and, and why is a mandate a way that they sort of seek to do that? Um, and before I go deeper into this, it's worth mentioning that, of course, um, and I feel like this is well known in your country, that certainly came out in our conversations on Friday, it's very well known in mine, I'll come back to this, there are two really different sets of reasons people will be under-vaccinated. And they usually apply to quite different cohorts, although during COVID-19 and indeed prior, we did also have an understanding that sometimes they will have a kind of relational um, effect within the same group. So um, sometimes if you're not well reached by government's, government programs, you might become you know, reluctant to engage with them. So I know that they're not always distinct groups, but often they are quite distinct groups. One group, happy to vaccinate, but have, this is people with complex lives, logistical challenges, socioeconomic disadvantage. So it can be hard for them to get to the vaccine appointment or to prioritise it in a complex, messy life. And then of course, the ubiquitous idea of the mum who's worried about vaccines harming her beautiful baby. So despite this, it being known in, in, in many settings that these are quite different reasons, um, it's not, it's, you know, it's not clear, it's not self-evident which one of these or just one of them or both governments might be seeking to attend to when they introduce a vaccine mandate. And certainly, um, they tend to be thinking about and talking about this issue because it's much sexier, it's much more well-known, it's much of a, you know, it was the a 2019 World Health Organization, one of the top 10 threats to, you know, human health is this vaccine hesitancy, vaccine refusal one. So that's the one that kind of sucks up all the oxygen and gets all the attention. But a combination of both of these will contribute to any jurisdiction's under vaccination problem. So um, in, in order to start our dive into, well, what was going on in this case, it is worth understanding that um, in all the jurisdictions that I'm looking at, there was a, a form of mandate already. Um, so that's a, that's a really crucial and important point. It's not like they went from nothing to, oh, let's have a mandate. They were doing something in the mandate area more generally, but they were not, the mandates they had were not imposing consequences on vaccine refusers. So they were either just covering a few vaccines and they weren't really well enforced, or they had specific opt-outs, so people who didn't want to vaccinate could go through a bureaucratic process of declaring themselves a vaccine refuser and then still be allowed to access whatever goodies might otherwise have been withheld for people who weren't vaccinated. Um, and, and so, and you might think, well, that sounds bonkers, but the point of all of that is that these mandates were not designed with vaccine refusal in mind. And rather, they were functioning as a bit of a cue to government, particularly in France and in Italy, a cue to government to a, a sort of note to self, we've made these vaccines mandatory. Oh, God, we better, better make sure we're actually getting them out there and getting them into the population. Also, of course, cueing all of us, the general public, to schlep along and get our child vaccinated at the appropriate time in order to comply with that mandate. And if you're not against vaccination, that's perhaps not a particularly you know, dire thing to have to go through. So we've got this idea of the access backbone operating in, in all of these places. Um, and indeed, in, um, in 
in Australia um, that had been taken the form of a special payment that was for people who, um, it was a, like an immunisation uh, incentive payment. It started out as in the late 1990s. It was then rolled into middle class welfare for anybody um, raising children. Uh, and in the United States, um, again, there's a long history of mandating vaccines for entry to school because their public health system is virtually non-existent. Again, it was a way of kind of making that the consumer's problem, get them activated, get them out of bed, uh, get them vaccinating in order to get their kids into school. And again, because that policy was not designed with vaccine refusal in mind, nor was the Australian policy, that's why we had these personal, exemption, personal belief exemptions built in. So um, despite all of this, you know, we see the, the vaccine refusing parent being the problem, the contemporary problem, the contemporary articulation of a problem that has led to the adoption of mandates in each of these settings. So because I've got a bit longer today, just a quick note on um, my research methodology. Where it, it's hard being a comparative person, as I, as I have discovered, but to the extent I've been able to really try and, you know, ask the same questions, examine the same phenomena in each of my cases, starting out using um, policy literature, translating it what I need to, some really good secondary literature in, in some places as well, um, and then working out what I didn't know and how I could find it out and from whom, helped by some amazing in-country collaborators, and then doing these key informant interviews and then analysing it all in in vivo. And I have published quite a lot of papers out of my cases, um, but less comparative papers, or certainly less papers comparing all of them. So that's really what the book is seeking to do. So who did I speak to? Well, you can see I dived pretty hard into my own country because the Australian states have their own vaccine mandates, which are all a little bit different, um, as well as a, a national one. And then, um, you, again, you can see the, the people I spoke to in um, the other jurisdictions and the kinds of people I spoke to who... Um, and with the Provax activists and academics as well, people who were involved. Um, what am I? Oh, I'm rustling. Apologies. I'm okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm too flamboyant. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, so certainly, um, speaking to these people because they're involved in the implementation, or were intimately sort of had some know-how about how and why things happened. So, pretty good sense of what did happen in each jurisdiction as a result of these interviews. So perhaps the most important um, thing that I want to start with in, in, in sharing my findings is that, you know, I kind of went into this thinking, oh, you know, vaccine hesitancy or, and, and refusal is, is sort of a global problem. It is understood as a global problem. So it makes sense that each, it makes sense that a bunch of countries or jurisdictions would choose to act on it at the same time and, and to act on it in the same sort of way because, let's face it, if you're dealing with recalcitrant parents who don't want to do something and it, the thing you want them to do is important, one way to do it is just try and make them. So it's not that surprising that we would see this kind of happening at the same time. But when I dived in, what I discovered was that um, the drivers in each setting were uniquely local. And although vaccine refusal played a part in all of them, um, it was certainly never the sole factor, and sometimes not, not even necessarily the major factor, um, and certainly not, not all epidemiological. And what I mean by that is, not everyone was facing the sort of crisis of, oh my goodness, if we don't mandate tomorrow, measles will be back the day after. It wasn't that situation everywhere. And the way I want to unpack this is by drawing this distinction between functional problems and political problems. So what do I mean? Well, sometimes a system will face functional problems as in it's literally going to break and fall apart. So if your vaccination system breaks and fall apart, falls apart, you won't have sufficient vaccine coverage in your population and then those diseases will come back. Um, and sometimes you, your system might not face a functional problem, but there might be political drivers that inspire or promote political actors to bring about a policy change, even though the system is actually chugging along okay. So putting um, my cases onto this schema, um, in, in France, there was actually quite low political pressure, at least to begin with. France did have a problem with vaccine hesitancy and refusal. They'd had some local scares, very specific French language stuff that the rest of us may not have known about. Um, but the political class did not want a bar of it. They did not want to touch it. They didn't want to do anything with vaccination. It was a poison chalice 
They were worried that if they drank from it, it would somehow bring them electoral misfortune. So they, they weren't having a bar of it. But the functional problem got too big to ignore when the Council of State, which is the highest court in the land, ended up ruling, for reasons I can't go into now, uh, ended up ruling that the French system had to change. They had a few vaccines that were mandatory. They had many more that were recommended and voluntary. And the court said, nah, -uh. they have to all be mandatory or they have to all be voluntary. You have to harmonize. So the government was like, okay, and they, and they even had a time limit. So the government was like, okay, well, to figure that out, they then embarked on this very um, large, sort of large scale process of making that decision. Super interesting. Uh, Jeremy Ward has written quite extensively on this as well. Um, so that's the French trip. Um, in Italy, there was a functional problem brought about by a vaccine scare in 2012. A lower court in the region of Rimini, uh, get this, made a ruling that vaccines had caused a child's autism. You heard me correctly. Um, and my colleague uh, Marco Rizzi and I have done a wonderful deep dive into how that happened and what happened as a response. So we've published a couple of articles on this. They're open access. You can have a read of them. It's, it's a fascinating story. Can you imagine what happened? Vaccine rates for MMR plummeted. And um, the system was not appropriately responsive to that. And so things just kind of went downhill over about five years in terms of vaccine coverage and they ended up sort of having to mandate. So that was a functional problem. Um, but there were also political problems or political drivers because um, in the regions, pro-vaccine parents were getting antsy, regional actors were getting antsy. They even brought in their own mandates. And then as that start, you're gonna start to get this patchwork of local policies and they said to the national government, come on, step up, make a policy for all of us. So that was the sort of, so that's why I say there were high functional and high political pressures there. In Australia and California, these systems were not facing a significant threat from vaccine refusers in terms of um, at a general population level, rates were high, they were pretty stable. There were pockets of under vaccination due to refusal, which were definitely a problem for, for um, outbreaks of disease. But this was not a system, you know, facing failure. What we instead saw was uh, political pressure. In Australia, just finished a, a, a paper on this, currently submitting to a journal. Um, it was literally down to one policy entrepreneur, a deputy editor of a populist um, tabloid newspaper, who, who designed and popularised the Australian vaccine mandates right down to the names of those policies. So our account of her is, is you know, really shows what, a, what an incredible situation this was, that really one person mobilised all of this um, media and community power to drive those political changes in Australia. And in California, um, the parent activists, Sam's written on these as well. Um, obviously, we look at them quite a lot in the book on California. These were people who got upset that vaccine refusers had basically been able to have a society that catered for them. They could go anywhere. They could do anything. There were no consequences for their refusal. And these parents who were vaccinating their kids and still finding that their communities were unsafe got kind of angry and wanted to reconfigure society so that that would no longer be the case. So that's the functional and political pressures. So what I want to explore now is, um, and this is now getting into this question of our vaccine mandate solving uh, the, or tackling the right kind of problem is some baseline things that you would want governments to kind of think about before they were going to mandate vaccines. And so the first question here is, okay, well, th th for me anyway, this was the next logical place to go in my inquiry. So what is government actually doing to make vaccination easy and possible for people? Um, and are they doing anything that's making it hard and, and, and you know, imposing barriers? And that was quite a interesting journey. So the things that governments can do, this is how I sort of separate them into, you know, earlier I guess I talked about that access and acceptance distinction. These don't quite map on, but they can map on a little bit. So in terms of wanting communities to be able to easily access vaccines, certainly what you want to be able to do is make vaccines free. Make the vaccination encounter free. So you're not having to pay to get it, you don't have to pay the person's time who's giving it to you. Um, and you want it to be easy for people to actually go and get them. So you want availability of clinics and things that are open at convenient times and all that sort of stuff. So 
you know, to me, I was like, well, that's sort of the least the state can do, really. Um, but, you know, it actually was not... Um, it, it, I, was, I was shocked and appalled to find that actually that was not really happening in some of these places. So I won't go into the California example because I'm sure you all have a pretty good idea of how dismal the American public health system is. So I'm sure you can imagine that it's not just as simple as sort of everybody gets to rock up and get vaccinated for free. But I'll tell you about France because, you know, we have this idea, or at least I did in Australia, you know, France, you know, socialist society, you know, state looks after you. Let me talk you through getting your kid vaccinated in France. So you schlep along to the doctor and you get a prescription for the vaccine. Then you take your prescription and you schlep along to the pharmacy or the chemist and they give you the vaccine. And then you take the vaccine and if you're not going back to the doctor, you schlep home and you put it in the fridge to maintain cold chain. Then you get it out the fridge and you schlep back to the doctor and they vaccinate your kid. So I was appalled to hear about that system. I could not believe how difficult it was for French families to vaccinate their children, and it's not free. So the, the state isn't paying for those vaccines, never mind the encounters with the professionals that you might face. And in fact, when France man made its new mandates, the government looked at, they, I told you they did this very elaborate sort of analysis of what they should do, and one of the things they looked at was, well, how much would it cost us to just pay for everybody's vaccinations? Looked at the figure, nah, not gonna do that. So they pay for some of it, um, people's private health insurance pays for some of it, um, there's not supposed to be a gap. There's clinics for poor people, but they really are for poor people and, and they're sort of not very easy to access. And so it's not, you know, I wouldn't take my kids there because, you know, it would be very clear that I should be doing it this other complicated way. So that was really quite shocking. So that's sort of that access piece, that access space. The other thing that governments need to be doing to facilitate and encourage vaccination is communications and persuasion. And I sort of mean a few different things by this. One thing I mean is that you need a kind of steady, slow drip feed of the idea, which will also activate people who are not hesitant or at risk of being hesitant. It will just remind them why they should be doing it, but also will kind of make the case for anybody that might otherwise be hesitant. Vaccines are important. They do a really good job of protecting you and your family and your loved ones. They also protect the community. So just, you know, doing that piece of work. And it was quite interesting that in my field work, people often talked about your NHS as being a really good way that that, that message was kind of continually reinstilled into the population through generations. I know the NHS is in trouble and it's potentially always in a bit of trouble. And, and anyway, I know things are pretty dire, but certainly that reputation of the NHS as being the, the agency that can do that really well. Um, and as part of that as well, so you kind of have this low-level drip feed, but then if things blow up, if you, get a, if you get a crisis, if you get a vaccine scare, if you get something that's going to generate a functional problem for your system, you need to step that right up. You need to be throwing resources at persuasion, targeted campaigns that speak to people about the thing they might be concerned about, speak to a particular group that might be hesitant and uses trusted messengers. There's, there's a huge field of research about how to do this properly. And you know, governments need to be doing that work if, you know, if something happens that disrupts or threatens to disrupt their system. As you can imagine, I went looking to see whether they'd been doing that before they mandated. What do you think I found? And in fact, um, you know, Italy, France and Australia all did sort of big communications campaigns, vaccines are great, blah, 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 this is why they're important. But they didn't do that until after they'd mandated. So what they were really doing was, by that point, they were manufacturing consent not just for vaccines, but for mandates. And I think that's really important, don't get me wrong. I think you need to do the hearts and minds work if you're mandating so that you're coercing the fewest number of people possible. But imagine if you did that work before, might not even need to mandate. So anyway, if you're interested, um, that paper there kind of dives into that issue a bit more. Um, so, okay. so. The next set of questions that I think we need to be asking is what tools does government utilise to ascertain the cause of non-vaccination? So again, I've said a couple of times now, we know in every population there'll be some people who don't vaccinate because they don't want to, and there'll be some people that the system isn't reaching because those people have got a lot of complex, difficult stuff going on in their lives. And um, since both, both of those groups together make up our under-vaccinated cohort, 
And since we really can't tolerate that cohort being more than 5% of the population, if we want 95% vaccinated, you need to be trying to put out both fires at the same time. And in order to do that, you need to understand a lot about those fires. I mean, where are they burning? Amongst whom? For what specific reasons? Do you think governments know that? So, epistemological constraints. To some extent, governments were facing issues across both of these domains that makes the project of mandating vaccination to solve a problem that you don't even really understand a potentially a problematic one. Firstly, does the government know who is and is not vaccinated? Well, in half of my cases, sort of yes. In Australia, we've got the oldest vaccine, um, oldest electronic vaccine register in the world, which means it's super clunky and not that great, but it's, it has done great work for many years. Good old Australian immunisation register. Um, so the government knows the vaccine status of every child, right, because it's recorded against their identity. Similar thing in Italy, but messier, because it's done at a regional level. Wealthy regions have electronified, electrified their registers. Poor regions, paper. Move around Italy, presumably your record should follow you. Uh, France and the United States generally, they don't know who is and is not vaccinated. So they will ask their frontline educators, the schools, childcare centres to check vaccination status, but they actually don't know, but that, that information doesn't get translated up or go anywhere. So only the gatekeepers would have been exposed to that information while they were checking the records and supposedly not letting in people who were not vaccinated. Um, so in France, I'll talk you, get, talk you through how France sort of deals with actually working out how many people are vaccinated, like what percentage of the population. They look at, uh, they, they do a survey. Um, they survey the population um, to find out whether they're vaccinating or not um, and rely on them telling them. And of course, that's just a sample. And they look at how many vials of vaccines they sell or buy or whatever, you know, how much um, product is moving through the system. Wastage, well, yes, you'll sort of estimate what's going on in the realm of wastage. But again, um, so, so quite sort of, yeah, you're putting together lots of little pieces to try and get the picture, but I'm not really sure you're getting it. So really unclear that they know what's going on in their populations. And then the other thing, of course, is do they understand who's unvaccinated for access reasons and who's unvaccinated for acceptance reasons? And in almost every context, again, the answer was not really. In Australia, when we used to have these exemptions that people could apply for, we would actually know, oh yeah, X percent of kids have one of these recorded against their name. Some researchers have done additional work to show that, yes, well, that doesn't explain all of the people who are objecting to vaccination. There's some reasons why people wouldn't get one of those. Maybe they earn too much money, so they don't need to apply for the exemption because they're not getting the, they're not getting the, the um, social security, etc. So they'd estimated that it was about half and half. But in 2016, when we got rid of our objections and when you actually had to vaccinate, we now have no data on, you know, how many, how many Australians are not vaccinated for belief reasons as opposed to access problems. Um, so it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty complicated, um, but there's, there's very, very poor knowledge of this. Um, so focusing on vaccine refusal with this kind of Half, oh, sorry, I should point out as well that France, I sort of spent quite a bit of my earlier talk bagging them out, but France does have um, a real strength here. They have been surveying their population for many years, asking about vaccine attitudes. They have this thing called the health barometer. Um, so that's where they're actually, when they say, well, you know, X percent of French people feel in these various ways about vaccination, the government is actually collecting that data routinely. So um, hats off to France for that little piece there. Um, okay, so thinking about things in these ways um, and with the sort of gaps in knowledge that I've told you about, what I want to now share with you is the way that key actors in these countries or jurisdictions were talking and thinking about the, the, the idea that some of their population might be unvaccinated for access reasons um, and, and, sort of that this, and, and how they were kind of more broadly talking about their under-vaccination problem. So in Italy, the, 
the government is the vaccinator. So in Italy, uh, you have people working for, you know, sort of the equivalent of the NHS, but in, in, in regional levels, they are the ones who vaccinate you. They're the ones who write to you and tell you to come in and get vaccinated. You don't come, they call and they call again. And eventually they will be the ones who initiate fines if you're not vaccinating your kid. So I think when the state's doing this work itself, it's probably in a pretty good position to say, provided its, its systems are well resourced and, and working well. And in the places I went to, the frontline workers felt that it was. So they feel they're doing a pretty good job of reaching underprivileged people and vaccinating them. And, and again, anecdotally, they feel that those people are happy to be vaccinated, want to be vaccinated. So, so it's sort of based on that, that the government did reach this conclusion of our problem is an acceptance problem way more than it's an access problem. And I've told you the story about the court case and the you know, falling rates. So it's, you know, that, that certainly lines up. Part of the story initially as well is that, um, you know, public communications, you know, of that big ambitious kind to tackle vaccine scares, well, they don't really work because in Veneto, um, which is um, the wealthy um, area which includes Venice, I'm sure you guys probably know that, but I have to include that for Australian audiences where people don't know, um, they had experimented with the national government's um, approval and indeed encouragement with getting rid of all the old mandates. They'd had these mandates for a few vaccines. They were largely broken. They were largely not being used. So Veneto said, let's sweep them away. And it was all this sort of ambitious idea of let's be modern and European, which maybe meant let's be like the UK. Um, let's have everything voluntary. We're, we're a mature population. People will choose to vaccinate because it's the right thing to do. And the Venetian um, local government, were, they were really, the technocrats were really smart, they were really onto this and they said, righto, what we'll do is if our vaccination rates fall and, and there's a sort of trigger point, we'll unleash the comms and we will, you know, turn things around. So they had this grand plan of, for their experiment. But what happened was when that vaccine scare happened, Veneto hit the ground faster than anyone. So the people in the national government were like, uh -uh, okay, comms don't work. Um, Veneto was a failure, and in fact, that my, one of my favourite quotes from this whole project was um, a, a ministry official saying to me, Italians need to be told what to do, and they need to be told by a mandate. So that was that, was that story there. Um, in California, I've talked about this a bit already, um, for the parent activists who are the real drivers of this um, policy change, it was about reordering society in the way that I described. The health actors also understood that because their public health system is pretty um, ordinary, um, you know, mandates are necessary to actually uh, get the most underprivileged people vaccinated. So the idea that you, um, you know, the idea that you'd sort of worry about that group and do anything different with them other than have a mandate for them is, is just fine because that's how you activate them to overcome the fact that the system is rubbish, basically. Okay, in Australia, it was really different and that's, this is really interesting. So in Australia, we definitely have this discourse that vaccine refusers are bad. Um, they're, a, they're a pretty despised group in Australia, perhaps relative to some other places. Um, but social disadvantages in the frame. So I talked about, you know, the fact that we actually did have data showing that, you know, a, a significant chunk of our under vaccination was deriving from access problems, not from refusal. So that was known about. Now, the federal policy that we have, which withdraws um, a percentage of people's um, uh, social security payments and withdraws entirely the money that the government gives them to pay for childcare. Um, so basically that, that, that applies to everybody who, um, everybody who is eligible for those payments. And there's certainly no, no sense that you would um, treat disadvantaged people any differently. But at a state level, super interesting. This is the only place that I've discovered you know, and I've looked beyond my case, it's the only place in the world where they do this, they actually say, okay, we don't want our state mandates, which are called no jab, no play, play as in go to childcare, go to early education, go to kindy. Um, we don't want those to apply to poor and disadvantaged people because actually they're not the people we're trying to reach with our new mandate. We are trying to reach the people who are refusing. So the states that have these policies, and now five of them do, um, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on which political party was in power, that's another whole deep dive I'm happy to revisit in questions, have designed exemptions 
But in the states where we had Labor governments, um, what those exemptions look like is basically, if you've got a particular kind of card, it's called a healthcare card, and it means that you're on some form of welfare. If you've got one of those, you can enrol your kid and they don't even have to check the kid's vaccination status. You can just get straight in. What the government is saying here, and this was explicit in the political debates in, in our parliaments, it was also reinforced in the knowledge and understanding of the health department bureaucrats who were advising government. What it's saying is, we're not saying the vaccination status of these kids isn't important, it is, but we're saying that these kids attending education and care is, is crucial to their wellbeing and development, and to exclude them would create really dreadful consequences for these kids. So we're choosing to not have the mandate apply to them. We're not saying come in and forget about it. We're saying come in, then we'll wrap the services around them and get them vaccinated. And that should be easy enough to do because we assume the parents are happy to vaccinate and are not vaccinating because of these access barriers. So that one's super interesting. But again, remember that the federal system is making everybody vaccinate anyway by controlling the money. So I think the states have a little bit more leeway to exclude disadvantaged people from the mandate because those people were getting swept up with the money anyway. I hope that makes sense. I'm happy to revisit in questions if anyone's unclear. Um, meanwhile, in France, they've got that data that I talked about. The health barometer shows, seems to show, that hesitancy is a problem, not access. And again, the government officials I spoke to, oh, no, we have no access problem in France. Okay. Um, but crucially, ethnicity is invisible in France. It's taboo to ask anything about ethnicity. So there's probably a whole bunch of things you don't actually know about your population because you don't ask. Because, you know, we know in Australia, for example, one of the things that will get that exemption for you in childcare is the fact that your, your children are Aboriginal, right? So that's seen as a group that we want to make sure are getting really good early education and care. So we know that because we ask. What is the French government not asking about its population? The other thing here in France is that I talked about that consultation period, um, a very complex consultation that the government had done to work out what they should do with their mandates. And as part of that, they found out that um, if they made all their vaccines voluntary, which was one of their options, they would see the lowest income people, cohort, in their society they were the ones who were going to stop vaccinating. So when faced with that, the people who were making the decision, who of course were more high income, technocrats, um, you know, much more privileged people sort of thought, oh God, we don't want to be the ones who make vaccines voluntary and this, most, this lowest income cohort is the one that's going to stop vaccinating. So um, that data was quite powerful for them making that decision that a mandate would apply to everybody. So if a mandate's going to apply to everybody because you're worried about the lowest income people not getting vaccinated, adopting a policy like the Australian states have would seem a bit bonkers, wouldn't it? Have you just made this decision that these people's vaccination status is so important that that's one of the reasons to mandate? So I'm just briefly going to talk about, I used to call, I used to talk about the design of mandates as though Somebody sat down with, you know, a blueprint paper, oh, let's, you know, how should we do this? We, we have a policy problem, let's design an instrument to solve it. And I realised that was a pretty silly way to talk about what happened, because actually there wasn't a lot of design thinking going on, and in fact what was generally going on is that um, governments were using a lever of government, uh, sorry, a, a policy lever that they had available, so in Australia, um, the feds control the social security and the states regulate um, the childcare sector. So that's why they reached for those instruments. But almost everyone basically just looked at the mandate that they already had that was a bit rubbish or that wasn't working properly or wasn't um, imposing consequences for refusers and, and basically just tweaked that. Um, they certainly never looked outside. So they would to an extent. So, for example, in the Italian parliament were like, well... You know, California has recently, you know, changed its mandatory vaccination policy and it's working very well, so we should do that here. But they were, their policies were different. They were doing different things, but they were broadly understanding they've mandated we should do it, never looking deep into this design question. And the only time we see sort of importation going on is internally. So I described how the Italian regions pushed that policy up to the national level. We're sick of having piecemeal. Can you please do it? 
and uh, in Australia, you get the states and the federal system all bouncing off each other and everyone's kind of doing it at the same time because this uh, deputy editor of the newspaper is pushing all of them to do it. So, conclusions. Limited conclusions, just from what I've talked about today. Not much, not broader conclusions about mandates, which I am happy to revisit in the questions. Um, I wanted to understand why, why were the Australian states the only ones who really um, paid attention to the access issue and in fact paid such close attention to it that they decided to explicitly make their mandates not tackle um, or not, not have a negative impact on these people who faced access problems. The mandate was going to be all about, you know, dealing with the problem of vaccine refusal. Why did they do it? Well, one of the things that was actually quite inspiring to discover was that it was about policymakers' awareness of the access problem. I talked about how in Italy and France, you know, I was told in quite forthright terms, oh, you know, we don't have an access problem here. Oh, all of our under-vaccination is due to rejection. But the policymakers in Australia didn't think that, and they couldn't really get away with thinking or saying it, because for years, the academic community had been socialising them to understand these access barriers. Um, and in fact, you know, Professor Julie Leask, who is a, a, le a global leader in this field, um, and the generation of vaccination social scientists that she's brought up and inspired, and of which I'm one, we've all been talking about this for a long time. And every couple of years, we have a conference where the academics get to present to the policymakers. Um, it's a national thing, so all the state actors are together. Um, and, and I just feel like this stuff is absolutely in the kind of policy ecosystem, in the soup, um, and it's known about. And so when, when the policies were coming in at a state level, certainly the Labor the Labor politicians who brought this in were very receptive to the idea that you want to protect these socially disadvantaged groups. You, you don't want to sweep them up with a mandate and somehow make their lives worse. Um, but also, you know, the, the bureaucrats would have been there as well, speaking truth to power and saying, hey, like, I know you're seeing vaccine refusal as the problem. How's about we don't make another problem for these disadvantaged people in the process? Um, so that, that's quite, that was, as I said, that was quite an inspiring thing to, to discover. Um, and the rest I've really already talked about, but I'll just reiterate briefly. Um, as well, I think the Australian states could afford to make that decision because the federal policy was already governing people's behaviour, everybody's, and the federal system is just like ruthlessly bureaucratic. You know, your, your payment will be terminated in 55 days as your child is not up to date. You just get these dreadful form letters that get sent out. So, you know, there was no, no um, accommodating social disadvantage there. It's just we're turning off the money tap, run off and get vaccinated. Um, and in continental Europe, as I've suggested, there was a bit more of this paternalistic approach. And by paternalistic, I don't necessarily mean bad, but I mean that they saw that mandates would, would do a really important job for the, the most disadvantaged people in, in the community. And yes, those people might be disadvantaged further by not being allowed into early education or care if they're not vaccinated and then they've got to wait till they're fully vaccinated and then they can come. Um, but they really felt that, th that their mandates, especially in France, were doing important work for that group. So it would be perverse to have an exemption for those people. And again, in California, even more so, because their mandate had, it, had its roots in that access backbone that was about activating people in the absence of a public health system to get vaccinated, um, and, and therefore that's the thing they're relying on to get everybody vaccinated, uh, again, it would seem perverse that you would have an exemption for people who are poor and disadvantaged. So, I'm very proud of myself because I've done that, I think, under time. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my wonderful funder, the Australian Research Council of the Australian Government. Um, and thank you all for coming. And I think I'm now going to go and sit over here with Sam and we're going to have... Thank you very much, Katie. I think you've really outlined how it's useful to think about a policy tool like vaccine mandates and think about, well, what are we aiming to achieve and um, how are those aims being implemented in different places? So the comparative piece is really, really good to see. Um, I wondered if I could kick off with an initial question with, um, and I know you work quite well, but for the audience who might not know it as well. Um, why these four countries in particular? I'm sure you yeah, great questions. 
It was literally that these were the first four cabs off the rank. Um, I was following California, that was obviously big global news, then suddenly my own country's acting, then suddenly the two European countries are acting. So this was the first four. I put this grant together in um, 2017 slash 2018, and at that point they were really the only four. Um, some other American states and Germany have now gone down this road as well. So it was, it was really about you know, the, the beginning of this trend. Okay. And would you add any more to this list um, if you were starting today? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I would. I, I would look at the other American states and then I think you would see a, a very interesting thing of policy transfer happening from California to other places and Germany again, I think. Um, Germany was super interesting because they brought in um, they brought in what we call mandatory declination, which is where you have a little bit like the conscientious objection thing. You have you have to vaccinate unless you formally go in and say that you're not going to. Um, and they that that barely I think that lasted a year or two, and then they're like, nah, okay, right now we're going to have mandates, um, in particular for measles. So I think useful background. Um, should we take some questions from the audience? Um, so, um, Isatur online has said compulsory vaccination policies have contributed substantially to the success of vaccines in the fight against infectious diseases. But she's asked, what are the ethical impacts of mandating childhood vaccination? Mm, huge question, and in fact, one that I think the ethicists and philosophers have have dived into quite deeply, uh, and I've dived into that quite a bit in my book with my collaborator Mark Naven, who is from. That discipline. Um, well, crucially, you know, one of the big questions is: should children cop? Should children be the ones that cop the consequences of their parents' decisions? It's children who miss out on education and care as a result of their parents' decisions. And if parents have money withdrawn, like they do in Australia, or um, you know, fi the fines in, in Italy are not particularly meaningful or useful. But um, you know, again, it's, it can be the kids that suffer. So that's one of the crucial questions. Um, but of course, another crucial question is, do we, you know, from a fairness perspective, are we all obligated to contribute to the project of what I call community protection and the hard scientists call herd immunity? Um, and, and I'm quite persuaded by the idea that, that we are all called upon to contribute to that if we can. Some of us, of course, can't. Um, medical exemptions are for, are for those people. So, yeah, it's, and, and I think, you know, from the research that I've done, I've ended up broadly where I started in that I'm not, I, I'm not against mandates for philosophical reasons. I'm predisposed to be for them for that fairness reason, but there'll be a lot of preconditions that I would want to see satisfied first, is including and especially that communications and persuasion piece. Governments can do that well enough, they don't need to mandate. So I got quite grumpy in the course of my field work to see that, that so I think that's an ethical part an ethical um, obligation on the part of government to try and do what they can to get us to do it voluntarily first. If I could ask, did you see examples where that was done really well? Well, again, it's, it's your country. You know, um, pe people, uh, and I'm told people often think vaccination is mandatory in the UK, even though it's not. Um, and also this idea of the ubiquity of the NHS and the fact that it's it's everywhere. It's it's there when you're birthing. It's there when you have your child health visits. Um, it was there as you were growing up. It was providing you with what you needed. So the state is giving you, uh, and and it's and, it, and you've got the state's got all these opportunities to communicate with you about those things during the sort of lo the, the life cycle of the human. Um, so again, I, I know that your lived experience of your health system is probably different than the, the sort of myth <laughs> that goes out into the world. And, and I didn't look at your case, but in the other cases that, you know, there was always uh, Britain on a pedestal. Thank you. So um, it's quite a big jump from uh, absolute freedom of choice to mandates. So my question is, are you aware of any of this country considering the same kind of middle ground positions, for example, nudges or incentives? Because it seems to me all of these states jump from freedom to mm. mandating. It's a really good question. So obviously the United States is the pin-up for that middle policy, which I call a permissive mandate, which is what Australia and California used to have. 
and it's basically a mandate for everybody with an opt-out for committed ideological refusers. Um, that's a, you know, there's, that's a historical artefact in America, America's vaccination policy, and, and it's an artefact of particular economic, social, and political conditions in America's history. Um, I think your question's really interesting because the answer is no. So although many American states are still hanging on to their mandates with opt-outs, you don't get any new adopters going, oh, let's have a mandate, but oh, let's, let's let people not comply if they don't want to. And I think the reason we're not seeing that policy, apart from as a historical artefact, is because all the hot air and fuss is about vaccine refusal. So why would you design a mandate that specifically let the people off the hook that you're kind of angry about and wanting to change their behaviour. So it would, yeah, I mean, COVID is, is a different story. And so I do want to be clear that I'm talking about childhood here, but I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing anyone. The, the, the um, public health uh, scholars love the, they love the permissive mandate because it's sort of best of all worlds, activates everybody, doesn't coerce anybody. So they're always saying, oh yes, if you're going to mandate, this is the way to do it. But politically, I don't think it's appealing to policymakers. Um, Joanne has asked online, have any low and middle income countries implemented mandates? Well, here I might defer to my lovely um, host and convener. Um, you know, yes, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll preface and then, then hand over. I mean, mandates are used in a lot of, uh, a lot of contexts and countries around the world. I would say largely as an access backbone than, than as a recent policy adopted to tackle the pro perceived problem of vaccine refusal. Um, but I'll hand over to Sam. So, I mean, there are a, a lot of variations between um, these kind of mandates in uh, low and middle income countries. We did see um, quite a few over the last 10 years that seemed to be in response to outbreaks, a bit like what we've seen in higher income countries. Um, but the question there really has been the um, implementation of those policies, which um, on, on quite a few examples, and Uganda comes to mind, um, that hasn't been very strong. So you can see these laws come into place. There's a lot of hoo-ha, a lot of um, kind of a political attention, which also happens in, in um, higher income countries. But then whether that has an impact, um, it's harder to, to see than your slide. Um, it would be good to know if any mandates have had the reverse effect, because in general, we, we kind of assume, well, mandates do work. Um, we haven't seen any examples of mandates that have um, had an impact in lowered vaccine rates, but I think you have to think about that on the longer term and whether they do have the potential to lower uptake at some point in the, in the future um, and even lead to the collapse of a vaccine programme, um, which might be the case in um, Ukraine. Um, that's, that's one other example of possibly um, mandates um, having an adverse effect in that way. And I think particularly if you've relied on mandates to do your heavy lifting, which was something that I was, you know, concerned that the cases I was looking at were doing, uh, if you rely on your mandates to do your... And, and that, was, that was what the Italian story showed as well. They'd been relying on their mandates or at least the sort of appearance of a mandate to do the heavy lifting. And if you formally took it away and everyone knew you'd taken it away, like they did in Benito, then suddenly it was very easy for people to stop. Hi, so I'm really interested by the Australian like approach. Um, so I kind of got two questions rolled into one. One being this idea of bringing kids into the system because they're not denied access um, to sort of like, you know, no jab, no play, doesn't apply to kids from disadvantaged groups. Have you found that bringing them in to that system works faster than the kind of threat of the money tap going off? And is that kind of like access to this system where people are encouraging vaccination and providing sort of easier access, working faster than waiting for that 55 days till the money goes off. Um, and then my second part of it is, what happens in places like Tassie or like rural Queensland where you've got kids who ne aren't necessarily going into the same education systems, is there a separate safety net that kind of is there to catch those kids? Can you just clarify the second part of the question? Do you, do you mean if people are homeschooling or something? What yeah, do you mean? homeschooling or people who are going up, like, you know, rural Queensland, where they're going up on cattle ranches and stuff. Um, is it like, is that covered by flying doctors or something else mm. that kind of comes in instead? Okay, good questions. So in, in, in answer to your first question, we, you know, we don't really have the data on that. Um, 
part of the chat, well, it's a, it's a good problem to have, but we're, we're talking about quite small numbers of kids, right, um, that, are, that are unvaccinated or that are unvaccinated in particular places. So I can't answer that question of whether turning off the money tap, uh, whether, whether wrapping around the kids and letting them in, you know, is more effective than turning off the money tap. What we do know is that for whatever reason, um, and again, I don't think we really have the data on this, um, we don't know why turning off the money tap hasn't already worked for these kids, except one of the things we do know is that um, it might be because their parents weren't eligible for the money. So the federal mandate, like, you know, generally a family with two working professional parents would be earning too much money to get any state assistance. So um, that cohort isn't touched by, um, by that policy. And yeah, okay, it might be touched while the kids are um, in, you know, before they go to school because, you know, you have to be earning quite a lot of money to not get any childcare help. But what if, you know, one of the parents stayed home? Or what if you had a nanny? So again, there's so that's why that policy was brought in as well. It was like, well, we can't leave the rich ungoverned. So, so they might have been rich, and that's why, they, that's why they haven't been governed by it. So I'm blathering a little bit, but we don't really know. Um, in re and with, then with regards, in fact, the two states you invoked have got different policies. So Tassie doesn't have a no jab, no play policy at all. Queensland has a weird optional mandate which the childcare provider can choose to enforce or not. It's all their decision. Um, so as for what's happening in regional places, um, it's all, you know, Australia it has some extremely remote places. It is a challenge for all health services and frankly education and everything else. Um, but that, yeah, again, there are services and it will be around, yeah, when's the, when's the nurse flying in on the plane and, you know, um, it, and it's not that there are necessarily um, workarounds there for, you know, if you're late, you're late, and, and one of the, system, the, the federal system will sort of kick in quite brutally at that point. Um, but, you know, I think there is a bit of understanding as well that, you know, if you're having to wait, you know, a month or two for the flying doctors to come back, that that would be a sort of legitimate reason to not be vaccinated on time. Katie, you helpfully broke down the reasons for non-immunization into access and vaccine refusal. Um, where, where, where do you put in competing priorities mm. and what do we know about where people rank immunization? We live in a busy world mm. and I suspect that when many people are asked, why didn't you get your child immunized? They say, we just ran out of time. Sure thing. It's a great question. And I'm not at all a fan of the World Health Organization's three C's model, which um, I've written critically on, if anyone is interested. But that was picked up under this construct they call complacency, um, which is a, bit more, is a lot more of a judgmental way of putting it than you have. You know, in, again, and I, so I think it is definitely a challenge. I would put that under access right, under my schema, which is to say that, yes, okay, the, the access group we should be most worried about are those who are poor and disadvantaged and have complex lives. But then there is this other group, you know, the frantic two-family, two-working parent household where, yeah, it, it's a challenge to just, to get things done, all, all, all the logistical things to get them done. And um, that was certainly a group that the Australian government talked about um, when they brought in the mandates. And so they were aware that not only were they perhaps missing um, some of these people with really complex access reasons, on the other hand, as I mentioned, that those people are probably already vaccinated because of the money tap. But the higher income earners, busy people, that's where you can tap in with the no jab, no play. These kids can't literally come to childcare or kindy. Um, so it's a, it's a, but I, I, see, I do see that as a systemic piece as well, um, in, in that, you know, the system needs to make it as easy as possible, not just for the poor disadvantaged person without a car, which is a bit, diff which means something different in Australia than it means here, um, or, but also, yeah, the busy working person who might need a Saturday clinic or, you know, might need a very easy, might, might need the vaccines to come and be done at school or at childcare. Could we take the last two questions together? So here and then there was one at Thank the Thank you. I have one comment and one question. The comment is when you were asking Sam about a country that did it well. I have an example that it did really badly and that's Czech Republic where we have some child vaccinations mandatory and there have been 
for very many years. And I look at uh, Czech Republic about six years ago, so perhaps they are a bit better now. I doubt it though. But the problem was that the vaccine is very mandatory and there is absolutely no information from the government whatsoever. So if you were to Google vaccines, the only things that will come up would be anti-vax groups that have very accessible, beautiful, colorful websites um, with very, very well put together information, but obviously information that is wrong. And I just think, I thought this is absolutely tragic because this is communication is the low hanging fruit that the government could surely put together a website to communicate what they're doing. And I think this is like a nice way for the anti vax to step in. Um, so that was just, just a comment. And my question is, do you think that we can perhaps expect um, a decrease in uptake of vaccines in perhaps Europe and USA for various reasons, but I mean, mostly anti-vax groups and, you know, the spread of fake news on the internet and so on. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, um, so you talked about access and acceptance, and then I was wondering if you, um, if you've got the time, of course, to kind of delve into some of the factors around within acceptance. So I think the first things that kind of spring to mind is possibly kind of barriers or possibly kind of religious beliefs, um, kind of different um, relationships between the state and ethnic groups. One thing I was wondering about, um, and I'm thinking in the context of possible RSV vaccines um, that could be soon to launch kind of October, November, December this year, um, particularly in kind of the UK and Europe. Um, is there anything around kind of acceptance and how long um, the intervention, so in this case, the vaccine has been about? Um, so I think possibly like the case of MMR, the longer things are about kind of, of course, there's information on both sides that kind of spreads across community societies. Um, but yeah, if that's a factor that's come up. Awesome. Okay, I've written them down. I'm going to try and nail them super quick. Thank you to our Czech friend. Um, absolutely. What, what you described sounds a lot like Italy, but even worse. Um, so we're going to make you do it, but we are going to do nothing to tell you why you should. Abysmal, complete abrogation of government responsibility. But comms is expensive and hard to do well. And governments can just be like, well, we're mandating and that's all we need to do. But it's not all we need to do. Um, okay, so then the other question, are we going to see a decrease? Here I'd like to do a little plug for the book that Mark Laven and I are writing, where we say at the end that we're actually worried that the trend that California began of, of making vaccination more mandatory is likely to lead to a reduction of vaccines in, in basically in red states, in Republican-controlled states, because vaccination has become so completely politically polarised that the backlash um, may lead to massive functional failure um, there. Depressing. Um, reasons for refusal. We have a really good um, vaccination social science network in Australia. We have really good understanding. That, you know, I've been involved in project, big projects, big funded projects, sort of diving into this for the last few years. We have a pretty good understanding of our, our vaccine refusers, and, and I would put them into the kind of Brighton alternative wellness community. I think that's the right cultural reference for this audience. Finally, are we going to see... Um, are we going to see a problem with RSV? Do people like vaccines that have been around longer? You know, we, we know in Australia that we need to do some work around this for RSV. RSV. We need to get, get in there first and understand it, just like we had to do with COVID and just like we did with COVID. I suspect, you know, given the hoo-ha of one of the, you know, biggest cr criticisms people had of COVID vaccine, ah, oh, developed too quickly. Uh, and we know that's not really true, but that's what people thought. I think people are reticent of new vaccines. Again, think of HPV. I know it's also a different age group and it was tied up in all the sexual morality business. But again, I think, yeah, we, we can assume that new vaccines will hit a bit of resistance simply for being new. Well, thank you, Katie. So we've come to the end of our time. Um, if we could say thank you again to Katie and thank you to the audience for being so engaged and having great questions. <laughs>